both uh, chatting to Bernie and me here on Cash Flow today. 7.6% as we've just been discussing, you know, a number of these other figures uh, did come out above expectations and the market reaction has been pretty quick. Uh, the Shanghai Composite already in positive territory, up by 0.6% uh, of 1% and of course we saw that jump to session highs for the Aussie dollar as well. Uh, Wellian, let me kick off with you. What's your feeling on this uh, round of numbers? It's a tad higher than we expected. Uh, we, we thought it would be 7.5%. Overall, I think, I think obviously, like, like you mentioned earlier, it's a good set of numbers in the sense of a sigh of relief. I think, I think uh, although the debate about whether China is going to be doing a hard landing or soft landing will continue uh, for quite a while, but this definitely vindicates the soft landing side in which we are on. Uh, and overall, we, we see a H2 rebound. I think, I think we continue to overweight China as a market for, for both cyclical and structural reasons. Obviously, cyclically, they've proven to be able to, to manage a soft landing. And, and like we mentioned earlier, PVOC has um, been, been on, the, on the heavy on the growth side, rather the inflation, that, the inflation number that we saw earlier this week also vindicates the fact that they, they have the room to move and they are very keen to move on, 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 on boosting growth. Mm, okay, all right, let's see what Tony thinks. So would you agree with that? Do you think that we are going to get uh, more moves from uh, potentially the policy makers, potentially from the government, uh, with regards to, I guess, uh, prompting uh, more growth in China? Sure, absolutely. You know, I, I think where the sense of relief really is is with the FAI number. I think the FAI number is above trend in the last couple of months. I think looking at the uh, industrial output number is frankly a bit of a disappointment. If, if we had hit 9.3 as we did in April, I think it would have been a there would have been a, a much more uh, concerned uh, look by the market. So these numbers are kind of in line. I think we'll continue to see triple R reductions. I think we'll continue to see more. Uh, fixed asset investment pulled forward, more fiscal uh, stimulus. China is, after all, an investment-led economy, uh, and that makes up the majority of Chinese demand. Yeah, but uh, Tony, that's a, it can be a worrying point, too. And uh, William, sure. let me put the question to you. It was just a few days ago uh, that, uh, you know, that Mr. Wen announced that, you know, reforming the economy, uh, getting rid of the, uh, or trying to uh, shave down the misallocation of capital, too much money going uh, after non-productive uh, investments was, you know, that kind of reform is a bit of a, less of a priority and that stimula stimulating the economy is more of a priority right now. I mean, you know, if 50% of the GDP in China is comprised of investment, and that is unsustainable. There is no successful economy around the world that's been able to do that generation after generation. William first, and then uh, can I get Tony to uh, respond? So on that one, we've got to look in terms of cyclical versus structural. Obviously, obviously, on the structural sense, you want investment to come down, you want more consumption to, come to, to, to boost the economy going forward. But on the cyclical side, the big question remains on the, on the, on the question of global headwinds. Uh, if, if things do go bad again in, in Europe, or uh, U.S. fails to recover as quickly as, as people want to see, then obviously the cyclical uh, urgency of boosting growth is there. Uh, it's a big open question, but, but obviously uh, I, think, I think the government continues to do the right things in terms of structural reforms, boosting consumption, mm -hmm. while trying to basically manage this uh, cyclical uh, uplift that we're, we're seeing at, at this, at this, right at this okay. moment. Yeah. Right. Uh, Tony, do you see any missing bullets in the, in the, in the chamber as far as China goes? Or, is, I mean, or, or have they really pulled out everything that they have? Uh, I don't think they're necessarily missing bullets. Well, yeah, I mean, there are some things coming, but I think there are really two issues that you raised, Bernie. You, in terms of misallocation, first is the over 24% loan growth that we saw in Q2. A lot of that went still to Chinese state-owned entities. Okay, until we have more of those loans going to rapidly growing mid-sized companies and small companies, this will continue to be in the old fixed asset cycle. As we move more of that those loans into middle-sized companies that are much more efficient and growing much r more rapidly, then you'll have more of a direct GDP impact. Uh, I think the other part of it is that investment, as you, as you say, there are some missing bullets, there are some more things coming, but they've done a massive piece uh, of uh, financial stimulus and, and stimulated that quite, or moved a lot of that forward quite rapidly over the past three months. When you look at things like the rail investment from 2015 to 2020, and they pulled all of that forward into the current five-year plan, that's a huge allocation of resources. Um, Tony, William, let me ask you, uh, uh, moving forward, about something that we do often discuss when we get key data points uh, like this out of China, and that is 
on the reliability of the data because uh, you know some of the research that I've been doing does seem to suggest that uh, economists are getting even more wary than they were say six months ago about the reliability of this uh, data saying that they're turning up evidence the true picture in China could be worse than the, what these numbers are saying and and basically that they're subject to some form of political interference at various levels, you know, even going down right down to the local government level. Uh, Tony, is this something that you're concerned about when you get data points out like this from China? You know, it's not something I'm overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly concerned about. And the reason is these data are directional. You have to understand the direction that the data are going. Is the hundredth decimal point of a GDP report going to really uh, sway me one way or the other? Probably not. But I have to understand the directional nature of the data and do the numbers add up. And are we looking at other things like electricity consumption and you know the, the inventories of, of primary materials sitting on the docks, this sort of thing. So you have to triangulate these data with other data as well. Okay. Well, Ian, what do you think? Well, overall, uh, obviously, it's a macro number, but at the end of the day, macro number is an aggregate of micro stuff. And if you, look, you go to the ground, talk to companies, they're still quite happy to, to invest. They're still quite happy to, obviously, with the, even with the global headwinds uh, in mind, they, they, still, they still think quite highly of the, you know, uh, the new orders market coming in. Now, obviously, also, an uh, important thing to consider is employment rate. Can, uh, people continue to have jobs, and obviously, that, that's going to that's gonna give comfort for, for, for the policymakers to continue to, to be able to be, be okay. Let me, let me do, do the cyclical thing of trying to boost growth, but at the same time be, be aware of the structural concerns going down the road. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, certainly a lot to talk about this morning. We're going to get right back to it. Um, uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll catch you again soon, we hope. And we're going to have more with uh, Wellian Investment Strategies at Barclays a little bit later.